Up first, we are joined by Reg Spencer, the Head of Research for Canaccord Genuity. He'll be providing an overview of the rare earth sector. Good morning, Reg. Uh, good morning. Thanks, Jane. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us uh, today. Prepared a, a short presentation, and, and this morning we'll be giving a, a, a brief overview of the rare earths market, uh, our current take on the current uh, uh, state of play in the rare earth space, and also uh, a, a, an outlook. And uh, hopefully at the end of that, we'll have uh, a, a little bit of time for Q&A. As Jane said, my name is Rich Spencer, and I'm the uh, Head of Research at Canonical Genuity. Um, so why critical minerals critical? Well, uh, they are hugely important in uh, numerous emerging technologies such as computing, robotics, defence, but perhaps uh, most prevalent uh, in clean energy. Uh, and uh, it's those technologies that are reliant on the unique properties of critical minerals, um, and they use uh, a wide variety of minerals and metals. Now, critical minerals themselves uh, depend on the specific needs and priorities of, of countries and their supply and production capabilities. And what is critical to one country uh, might not necessarily, necessarily be critical to another. Uh, but on a higher level, uh, these most often refer to your battery materials like your lithium, cobalt, nickel, et cetera. Rare earths uh, also includes niche metals like niobium, as well as uh, what otherwise might be described as abundant metals such as copper. Now, geopolitics plays a key role in these uh, in the critical minerals markets uh, and the outlook for them. Um, this is mainly driven by China's dominance in the production of these metal, metals and minerals. Uh, and uh, that concentration of supply has the potential to risk uh, the independence of Western supply chains and the ability of countries to uh, achieve their clean energy targets. Um, now, we're probably going to uh, focus on, well, we are going to focus on rare earths today. Um, you know, talking about uh, the broader critical minerals uh, spectrum is probably beyond the scope of, of, of today's presentation and the time we have. Uh, so we will focus on rare earths. But they basically refer to a group of 17 elements uh, that have some pretty unique properties. Um, and it makes them highly strategic for the use in uh, a whole range of technological applications. Um, in their mineral form, they are classed into lights and heavies. Uh, but if we focus on the most important ones, it are those that are used in the manufacture of permanent magnets, which represent the largest end market by volume and at the value. Um, there are some other important applications, such as superconductors and lasers, which, uh, which are used in, in defence uh, and other industry. Uh, but the most important rare earths um, are neodymium, prosodymium, dysprosium and terbium. Um, now, these uh, materials are used to manufacture uh, magnets. There are two key kinds of permanent magnets. Uh, that's your uh, NDFEB and your samarium cobalt. The main markets for these magnets uh, consist of consumer electronics, uh, heating uh, and air conditioning, as well as automotive accessories. Um, samarium cobalt magnets are expensive uh, uh, and uh, NDFEB uh, are the strongest and are preferred for use in high performance applications. Uh, they also represent the fastest growing market segment given their use in permanent magnet electric motors, i.e. those that you would find in uh, electric vehicle drivetrains and uh, wind turbine generators. Um, so I'm going to run through a series of charts here um, uh, uh, looking at uh, where these magnets are used and the outlook for them. Uh, but your permanent magnet electric motors uh, do have a dominant uh, share in the EV market versus other forms of propulsion such as induction. And this really comes down to their uh, superior efficiency and lighter weight. Um, now with EVs continuing to penetrate the global auto market and based on our estimates, we think that uh, over 15% of global car sales this year will be in the form of electric vehicle. That's moving towards 50% by 2030. Uh, clearly the demand growth potential for permanent magnet electric motors, therefore magnets and rare earths uh, is, is quite strong. Um, there is some risk of substitution. Um, some of uh, you that follow this market will recall comments made by uh, Elon Musk at Tesla, where he would be looking at replacing permanent uh, rare earth magnets in, in his vehicles. Um, but uh, our view is that any substitution uh, of rare earths in the electric vehicle market will be more likely driven by supply shortfalls versus pricing. Um, and an example of that we'll use is there's about 250 to $300 of, of, of magnets in your typical electric vehicle. Um, the reality is that because these motors uh, that are driven by your rare earth magnets are, are better and lighter, we think that that's going to continue to see them dominate market share uh, and continue to be the main form of uh, drivetrain used in electric vehicles going forward. 
Um, the other key uh, part of demand growth, in, in our opinion, will be the renewable energy market. Uh, wind power is expected to be a, a key pillar of, of global renewable energy plans. Um, and as you can see uh, on the chart here, um, uh, the International Renewable Energy Association uh, forecasts uh, that global deployment of, of, of wind turbines will increase by over 150% just out to the end of this decade. Um, now, there are various forms of wind turbines. Not all of them use uh, permanent magnets in their generators, um, but given that uh, high wind onshore areas um, are now largely um, saturated with, with wind turbines, we are seeing increasing deployment uh, in high wind offshore areas um, and much larger uh, turbines, which means that you, you're going to need to use direct drive designs, and they're the ones that use your, uh, your, your permanent magnets in your generators. So with all of that, um, uh, the, the demand outlook for rare earths does remain strong in our opinion. Uh, as I said, this is expected to be driven primarily by your electric vehicles uh, and, and wind turbine markets. Uh, the chart on this uh, slide here shows our demand forecast going out to the end of the decade. We think that the uh, NDPR markets, uh, which we would otherwise use as a proxy for rare earths, given its predominant use in those magnets, uh, we think uh, can grow by a, a compound annual growth rate of around 9%. Um, you'll notice that uh, as it stands today, um, your, your industrial applications uh, and your uh, conventional auto markets do represent the, the largest demand centre, but as we move uh, out towards the end of the decade and as uh, EV penetration grows, we expect uh, EVs to become the dominant source of demand for rare earth permanent magnets. So the shifting focus to supply. Um, again, I'm, I'm sure most people on this webinar would be aware that uh, China does dominate the global rare earth supply chain uh, with over 90% uh, of refining and, and uh, magnet manufacturing. Um, if we look at upstream raw material supply or mined extraction, uh, Linus, which is the ASX listed company and Mountain Pass are the most uh, important producers with approximately 10% market share. Um, uh, but looking at the forecast, it's, it's important to note that the, the, the Chinese have been increasing uh, production of uh, rare earths domestically uh, over the last five years. Um, that might be viewed as a way to continue to control the market, especially as demand has, has been growing uh, so rapidly. Um, but it's that, domin uh, it's that dominance and, and concentration of supply that we see as, as a major risk uh, going forward. Um, uh, as I said, uh, changes in global feedstock supplies with, with mount, uh, Mountain Pass looking to uh, go downstream in their own right, the risk of export bans, um, high capacity, capacity utilisation in the Chinese uh, production base, uh, as well as permitting and financing of new projects uh, ex-China, uh, suggests in our view that, that there is the risk of significant supply shortfalls over the longer term. Um, and the, the implications for investors would be that this highlights the importance of the development of new projects, um, such as some of the ones that you'll be hearing about today. Um, so when we overlay our demand forecasts against our supply forecast, you'll see here that we expect the, uh, the NDPR market to be mostly in balance through 23 and 24. Uh, but as that uh, EV penetration uh, continues to accelerate, we expect uh, larger market deficits to open up from 2025 uh, all the way through to the end of the decade. Um, the, the lovely pink colour that you'll see there represented by other, um, that represents recycling, uh, which we think will be uh, become a more material, more important part of the supply uh, equation uh, towards the end of the decade. Um, but uh, as, uh, as is the case with, with many critical minerals and, and, and some of the key battery raw materials, um, you know, these markets uh, are all look to be characterised by uh, growing, uh, and, and, uh, growing market deficits uh, over the longer term. Now, implications for price forecasts. Where are they now and where could they go to? Um, this is quite instructive, this chart. It, it basically shows the history of NDPR pricing dating all the way back to 2011. Um, and those of you that were watching this market at that point in time would remember that uh, this was a period of time here uh, when uh, China banned the export of uh, rare earths. Uh, that came about um, uh, from uh, some geopolitical uh, tensions, uh, not too dissimilar from what we're seeing today. 
Um, what's different this time around though, is that uh, a, a decade ago, uh, that uh, those export bans and that high pricing did lead to substitution risk. Uh, we don't believe that's going to be the case this time around, uh, especially with the demand base much more stronger and demand growth is expected to be much greater. Um, so we, we saw pricing peak at the start of 2022 uh, at about $170 uh, a kilogram for NDPR. Pricing has fallen, uh, which we think is in response to uh, increased uh, production uh, or, or Chinese domestic production. Um, but that doesn't tell the full story, noting also that up until uh, that time and through 2018 to 2022, we also had a dramatic increase in, in global supply. So there is potentially something else at play um, in terms of the relationship and the dynamic between rare earth pricing and supply and demand, uh, but that blue hatch line uh, represents our pricing forecast going forward. Um, why are we confident about pricing going up? Well, uh, I might just go back a slide. Um, when you have supply shortfalls, or the only way to incentivise new supply to ensure uh, adequate uh, or, or, or adequate supply to meet demand uh, is through higher pricing. Um, the risk of uh, uh, Chinese exports or, or uh, the requirement for new sources of ex-China supply, is, in our view, is going to need a much higher incentive price than what we're currently seeing today at around $60 a kilogram in order to allow new projects to be, uh, to be developed uh, and financed into production. Um, in, the mean, in the meantime, uh, aside from incentive pricing, we do think that uh, that, uh, that that supply and demand will, will play a key role uh, in, in seeing pricing recover up uh, uh, onto about $135 or $140 a kilogram uh, level. So um, that uh, uh, is uh, the end of uh, my presentation today. Uh, it is pretty brief. It is a lot of ground to cover in such a short period of time, uh, but hopefully we've given you an indication of uh, where what we think the outlook for the rare earth market is. Uh, and I'd be happy to take a, a couple of questions. Wonderful, thanks for that, Reg. I mean, in your opinion, Reg, can you discuss the potential for further applications for rare earths, sort of as new technologies are developed? Yeah, we can. Uh, as, as I said in the presentation, Jane, uh, rare earths is a, a bit of a, an overused catch-all. Um, there are 17 rare earth elements and, and all of them have applications. Um, some of them are more important from a commercial standpoint than others. I know. Uh, my presentation focused on those rare earths that are used in magnets, like your NDPR, your, your DYTV, um, but uh, there are numerous others that have uh, important applications, such as semiconductors, quantum computing, uh, lasers, defence applications, so on and so forth. Those markets typically tend not to grow that quickly, and if you had, a, if you wanted to think about the demand outlook for them, it's probably going to be more in line with GDP for growth. Um, albeit that said, uh, rare earths uh, uh, for defence applications. Um, might be seeing increased demand on the back of current global geopolitical tensions, but um, that's probably a discussion for another time. Thank you. And just finally, so how quickly do you see the shift from China happening as new, as new projects come online? Uh, slowly, Jane. Um, I guess one of the defining characteristics of critical minerals markets and, and resources markets for that matter as, as a whole uh, is that supply is not that elastic. Um, uh, even when prices can be high, uh, it can take a long time to bring a new project online, regardless of whether it's critical minerals or gold and copper. In fact, the average lead time from uh, discovery through to production for your typical new mining project can be anywhere from seven to 20 years. Um, so what this is going to mean for the market is the, the risk of, of, of market deficits, um, and that's going to lead to supply short calls and higher pricing. Um, but uh, the importance of a new ex-China supply can't be underestimated. Um, the risk of the energy transition itself potentially um, rests on the, the ability of the West to bring on new projects. Um, we, you know, the, the world's energy transition can't rely on global supply of, of magnets or rare earths to be reliant on one country, which has shown in the past a tendency or, or on occasion to, to ban the export or prohibit the export of these critical materials. So, um, hopefully, Jane, to answer your question, it happens faster than what it is, um, but uh, there is some upside in, in, in delays in, in these new projects coming online, and that's through pricing. Wonderful. Well, Reg, thank you so much for your time today. A copy of today's recording will be available online in the coming days, but thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Jane.